So we built our leader, a, deliberately we build up our leader, and he also becomes this symbol of the new order. This is a dilemma of this movement. Sometimes you build the leader to the extent that at, at the end when you, have, you think you have become free, the fellow has become so powerful you don't know what to do with him. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's inevitable, we don't know how you do it. Then apart from this, from the fact that we build this actually during the movement itself, the traditions are such that power is understood in our own countries in terms of the individual, it used to be the chief, then it became the governor. Uh, colonialism didn't help us very much in building institutions. It's only now that we are trying to build institutions, to institutionalize government, to make, to make it collective. What is a cabinet to us? You talk traditionally uh, the idea of a cabinet government. Well, my university professors here understand it. But what is the idea of a cabinet government to the population here? By the mid-1970, the Tanzanian economy began to falter rapidly as a result of the rapid decline in exports and Tanzania's inability to import even the most basic commodities. Foreign aid decreased with IMF imposing conditionalities and the increased demand to repay loans. The economy was affected adversely by the oil shocks of the 1970 by drought and the war against the dictatorship of Idi Amin in Uganda also hit the economy of Tanzania. The IMF is no longer being used for the purposes for which it was founded. It was founded at the end of the First World War by the developed countries. Basically, frankly, by the United States and Britain. They are the founders, and until now, they are the controllers, quite frankly. They are the ones who have to decide what the organization is going to do. They, it was intended to be an instrument to avoid the, the economic problems that beset the developed wor world after the, be in between the wars, after the First World War. That was their purpose. We were not there. India was not there. The so-called Third World was not there. That organized the Bretton Woods instruments were never intended for the Third World. They were intended to deal with the problems of the, third, of the First World. I think the difference between myself and, and some of my colleagues is that I say so. I'm saying so. The IMF, the conditions of the IMF as they are, they are very rough for the poor countries. And I'm saying they're enough. Of late, there is a new condition. And this is of late. It's, n it's not in the charter of the IMF. It's a new conditionality. It's the whispers more than whispers. If you don't have an agreement with the IMF, we will not give you aid. This is terrible. The IMF, I'm saying, has now abandoned the purpose for which it was established. It was not a conspiracy. The way it is being used against us is not a conspiracy in the sense that it was founded to deal with our problems. It never was founded to deal with our problems. But in the course of time, it was discovered that it's very useful. It's a very good instrument of controlling the economies of the third world, of changing the policy, the direction of policies of the third world countries. It's a good instrument that can be used. And this is what it's being used for now. It, it's an instrument of control. It's an instrument of destabilization of the third world. And, and so I say so, because it's a fact. This is what is happening. And I'm, I'm saying to Africa, please watch out. Watch out. See what, what has happened when a country has signed an agreement with IMF. You see what has happened. It's a problem. I'm not saying poor countries should not be asked to tighten their belt. They're tightening their belt all the time. My people have just been saying, the people of Tanzania have been tightening up their belts all these last six years. But they go beyond that. Tighten more, tighten more. What is the purpose? It's never development. So that you may be able to pay the banks. 
It is tightening the belts for the purpose of private enterprise and the ability to pay the to pay the back. But I'm saying this is wrong. Mwalimu Nyerere was at the forefront of the most pressing issues for Africa at that time, the liberation struggle. He led the campaign to support the liberation struggle. Again, all these liberation movements based in Tanzania, including those from South Africa, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, establishing military camps for training for the freedom fighters in Tanzania. Apart from the political fight in the international arena, Tanzania was also host to hundreds of thousands of refugees from many of these countries, including the ethnic-torn countries of Burundi and Rwanda. The assistance provided by Tanzania did not stop at giving refuge and the military training. Mwalim also worked hard to bring the various factions of the liberation movements together, even before total independence. In South Africa, apartheid had taken a tight grip. Anti-apartheid leaders, Nelson Mandela, among many more, were in prison. Those young leaders who emerged later, such as Steve Biko, were murdered. Tanzania led the struggle for dismantling of the apartheid and for the release of Nelson Mandela. The activist role of Nyerere played in advocating the welfare of Africans, he was invited to address the first post-apartheid parliament in South Africa after the regime was voted off by overwhelming votes. About Africa south of the Sahara, you are isolated from the centers of power. <laughs> there, there is no internal problem, there is no internal urge in the United States or in Europe or in Japan to help Africa. None. And uh, I think, to some extent, the age of imperialism has gone. So you could easily be forgotten. <laughs> Africa, Africa is out of interest, of interest. When you have, when we are killing one another, we arouse a lot of interest. If we want to appear in, uh, in, uh, in European, uh, on European television, we can cause more trouble somewhere. <laughs> Africa south of the Sahara is isolated. Africa south of the Sahara, in, in the world of today, is on its own, totally on its own. Nyerere, as a man of integrity, was always ready to accept mistakes both in policy and in practice. To friends, I can, I can admit, and we, we have made a number of mistakes. Um, I think one of them I spoke about yesterday, only yesterday I was speaking one, about, about one of them. We, we nationalized whatever industries we had. We have a few industries in 60, around 67, when we became independent, and around 67. One of the major, uh, and industrially, we really did not have many industries to, to, to nationalize. But we had a very highly developed SISO industry based on, on um, estates. It was already beginning to run into some, some difficulty because of the world prices. The prices were going down. And, and we nationalized it. it. It was a mistake. It is quite clear it was a mistake. We did not have the management, the local management, to manage those farms. We, men, we, we nationalized some, some we, didn't, we didn't nationalize all the farms. We nationalized some estates and left others. And this has proved the others which we left, we, which we did not nationalize, are doing much better than those we nationalized, which we nationalized, although, of course, they had to function in the same, in the same uh, economic situation in the world. And, and the basic problem was that we simply did not have sufficient management. The management was not, was not uh, well, well developed. In this case, we made a mistake. That's one mistake. It's an, uh, one, one example of the type of mistake we made. I think also institutionally we made mistakes. We abolished the the cooperative movement. I think we shouldn't have abolished the cooperative movement. 